dovetailing on what Bob's saying there. Uh, I know I say this all the time, but persecution is increasing. Uh, I, I'm sure other people see it, but I, I'm just shocked how it's not talked about more. It, and I think church is where it should be talked about, but everybody's afraid of being political. I thought, this isn't politics. This is religion. When you go after churches to shut them down and to stop them and stop their message, that's not, it may be a political party or a political entity, but it's about stopping God's word from getting out. Now, the good news is it won't stop it. Uh, we've seen that throughout history. You, you, you stomp on the church, you drive it underground and it spreads. But the bad news is Satan has had 2,000 years to develop a plan. And I don't really apologize for talking about Satan as much as I do, but I've had people to say, all you talk about the devil, 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 devil. And then they'll sometimes follow us, I don't even know if I believe in the devil. I say, well, he believes in you. Uh, but that's part of the problem. And I think that's the plan. If, and again, I, I may be obsessive. Debbie says sometimes I am. Uh, and if you feel that way, let me know. I'll try to back off. But I am a little bit obsessed about trying to understand two things in life. Um, one, we talk about the purpose in life. I really think the purpose in life is to study and come to know God through study and through prayer, opening yourself up to the Holy Spirit. Because as I read the Bible, and only in the past eight or ten years I've noticed this because I used to do like a lot of people I'd read a section I read a book but now I focus on cover to cover message and there's a lot of messages in the Bible but from cover to cover the theme you're going to find is God revealing himself to you so that you get to know God and it's like how can we ever know God how can we understand a being like God? Uh, I've told you about when I taught religion. And in those religion classes, my biggest heresy and the, what upset my classes most was from my Christian students. The non-Christian students, uh, they never complained. My Christian students complained because I'd say, look, number one, I can't prove God exists. Uh, their arms fly and they get upset and somebody always said just look at a sunset I said well that just proves that there's a sun and we're in a heliocentric orbit I said but to prove the existence of God is something I cannot do scientifically or empirically uh, I can't fully prove the existence of Jesus because we have no body but if I were to take this to court we have enough eyewitness accounts to prove the existence of the man Jesus. Now, people will say, okay, uh, one of the authors I like to read who is agnostic, but he's a good researcher. He has come to the point, he says, he wrote a book about it. He said, Jesus did exist, but was Jesus the Messiah? Was Jesus the Christ? Was Jesus the Son of God? He said, I can't find any proof of that because the first thing he does is he takes away all miracles. He said, I can't prove that miracle happened. And I thought to myself, you're a smart man and you know that the proof of Jesus is through eyewitnesses. The miracles we hear about is through eyewitnesses. So illegally, if you took it to court, it would stand up. Uh, so what has Satan done? Satan's plan is to undermine the Bible. That's his first attack. Because this is what we base our faith on. The information we gather here. Once he's accomplished that, then he goes to offer a counterfeit. And you know what? That's exactly what Jesus says. That's what the Bible says about Satan. He is a counterfeiter. He lies. The father of lies. The imitator of God. And what's really interesting is in this day and age, people aren't reading the Bible enough so they don't know what the Bible says about Satan. And that's another thing Satan does. It's like he wants to hide himself. So he comes in the form of various other religions. Uh, when I talk comparative religion, 
one of the things I pointed out to my class is that in a comparative religion class, you try to look at all the religions in the world. Well, you won't get it done. There are just too many. But if you take the top 20, an interesting thing comes to light. Of 19 of those can be debunked as being spiritual in nature, even though they claim it. Uh, they base everything on physicology and on scientific evidence. The only one that's not, and we try to make it, is Christianity. Uh, in the early 1800s, late 1700s, you had this move toward intellectualism. And you'll hear people say, well, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Franklin, they were all deist. And for the longest time, everybody thought deist meant they didn't believe in God. No, what deism was, was a simple statement saying they can't prove God, but they believe there is a God, a deity. And that's deism. Now, people have misunderstood that, misquoted it, misinterpreted it. But they were deist. When they prayed, they prayed to the God of Scripture because that's the basis of their deity. And all they did was, and I don't have a problem with deism because all they did was say, I'm praying to God, but I don't know his name. Well, we don't know his name. Uh, it kills one of these people to jump up and say, oh, well, I believe in Yahweh. I said, Yahweh is not a name. It's not even a title. Then you get people mad at you because the more you know, the more likely you're going to make people mad because you're trying to correct the misunderstanding. But these deists came, and this is called the age of learning, by the way, too. Uh, Satan used that. He could go in, undercut it, and say, you don't even know the name of God. Here we have all these other religions which can be proven. Their leaders existed. They taught this, blah, blah, blah. And over the course of the 1800s and halfway through the 1900s, various cultic groups have popped up. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of theosophy? Nobody. It's interesting. I hadn't either. But I kept seeing the same things popping up in religions that were not part of the religion. Uh, you know, you study Hinduism, you study Jainism, you study Buddhism, all the Eastern biggies, uh, Shintoism, then you come to the Islamic religion, uh, you come to South America, you run into African religions that came to South America and were shaped by Voodoo and Makumba and that sort of stuff. All these religions... And they all start sharing some similar things outside of what their religions actually teach. And like I said, you teach comparative religion, you try to look at what their original doctrines say, but there's a new doctrine floating through all of them. And what's interesting was uh, I kept looking to figure out what this was, and I ran across the term theosophy, which theosophy can be traced back to the 1800s, but it got its big boost in the early 1900s by two people, a man and a woman, and they were either Russian or some form of uh, Eastern European, uh, but they called Russian, but they came to America, and they opened the book and called it Theosophy. So what does Theosophy teach? It's a blending of all sorts of things with a heavy dose of the devil. Theosophy believes in reincarnation, which more and more people now believe in reincarnation. It believes in karma. It believes, well, it believes a lot of Hindu stuff. Uh, but it also believes that there's two gods. There is the God of the Bible, the creator, which I thought, well, that's unusual. But he's not who we think he is. And then there's Satan, who is the equal God of the universe. And I thought, well, that's just what Satan wants us to think. And the scary thing is, if you listen to the young people today, they, they talk theosophically and they don't even know they're doing it. Uh, my students at the college when we taught religion, they would come up with this off the wall stuff. I said, that doesn't really fit any religion. And they said, well, this, this is what I believe. And we started running with what I believe. But what Satan has done is he has taken religions and sort of put them all in the pot and made this religious goulash. And out of it comes Satanism, well hidden, tucked away behind the vegetables and the meat and the soup, and it's just pure satanic worship. Now, we talk about persecution. Read your headlines.
Persecution is not in the news, but it is. Because they don't come out right and say, well, we're going to get that Christian. But they do stuff like what Bob's talking about. It's like, well, that wasn't toward Christians. That's toward a guy who was hateful. We don't want these hateful Christians. If anybody knows David Jeremiah, read his books or heard him, he ain't no hateful Christian. But if someone is on point, then they have to be squelched. When is the last time you've seen a faith healer knocked off TV? These people that wave their jacket and people fall down or they tell you, you know, what you had for breakfast, so obviously then these guys are like, and they and people make fun of other for charlatans, but they're not harmful. But you're harmful if you say transgenderism is a problem. Oh no, no, it's not. And I'll shock you with this. I understand homosexuals and transgenderisms on two levels. I understand it on a biological level. I understand it on a cultural level. And you mentioned some. That's where we make our mistake. We don't realize that the eyes that are looking at these things look at it biologically. And when the biology offends them, they move it to the cultural side. Um, there is a reason for transgenders. And that's why I, sometimes I feel a little, people think, well, where does he stand? I don't hate homosexuals or transgender people because I think I understand their motivation. And some of it they can't control. Uh, not to get too far into the woods on this, but y'all understand chromosomes, right? You guys are X's and Bob, we're XY. Now, because you're an X, you're girls. Because we're XY, we're boys. It's really that simple. You want to know if somebody is a male or female? Check their chromosomes. That don't change. But here's the problem. Within the world of genetics, there are sometimes two X people that get a Y chromosome added. Sometimes there's XY people that get an extra X chromosome added. You know what that's called in science? An abnormality. <laughs> Now, you can't use that word talking to a homosexual or transgender person. They get really mad. But you, just, you look at the book. The biology says these abnormalities occur. And what happens, you will find a woman who has some overt masculine traits. Or you'll find a man who has overt feminine traits. And that in itself, we've known that our whole life. I remember my mom. There was a guy in town. And he was, she called him Prissy. She said, well, you know, that guy's a little prissy. Had no idea what she was talking about. But later on, I'll find out. And he was a little prissy in that he liked to dress certain ways, not in women's clothes, but in just real, I guess you say prim and proper. He was <laughs> worried about his hair and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, uh, And he didn't do anything athletic like what guys do. He loved to hang around what girls do. So he was a little prissy. Now, he may not have had an extra chromosome. He may have just been brought up that way. Uh, I have a relative who was brought up in a household with two women. And for the longest time, we thought he was gay because he acted just like a woman. But he had no other role model. Uh, later on, when he got out and started working, now he's Mr. Macho. He's never done a single thing athletic, but he, he says he could coach anything. But he's changed. But this is the world we live in. Satan uses this to divide us. And right now, politically speaking, we have the Democrat Party, and I'll go ahead and say their name. They're dividing this country because they're focusing on the minorities and saying, you people are victims of the hateful people. And who's hateful? Anybody that talks yeah. about God. You know, if, you, if you say anything about God, the first thing we're comes out of their mouth is, oh, you mean the thou shalt not God? Yeah, I do. Because he gave us Ten Commandments, and they start with thou shalt not do this. Don't do this. I said, is there anything wrong with telling somebody not to do something that's harmful? Well, it's so negative. We need to be positive. Okay, so let's change it. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt do this instead of don't do that. That's what they want. But what they're doing is they're watering down the religion. And then in the process, and we've seen this in our Methodist brothers, who decided they're going to ordain gay people, even though the Bible says it's an abomination. You say, well, you know, well, let's not call them names. Okay, let's not. 
But let's be honest with them and tell them that it's considered sin in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with being honest with people, you would think, until you come to the 21st century. Now, honesty is a real problem. If you're honest, you're a hateful person because honesty is hate. And that's what we're running at. And this is the subtle message that God has sold our young people on, particularly our young people, because they don't want to have anything to do with church anymore. Why? Well, we're negative, we're hateful, uh, we're closed-minded. You see, anything that says there's an absolute in the universe, that's a closed mind. Oddly enough, though, they're the ones that will preach to you physics all day long because God didn't create the universe. The universe created the universe. And uh, that leads to the ultimate thing. They agree that man is the crowning achievement of creation, but the universe created it. So who created the universe? Take a wild guess. Anybody want to jump on that book? Who created the universe? The Big Bang Theory, according to them. Well, Big Bang's out. Sorry, no more Big Banging. Uh, the Big Bang works. I actually think the Big Bang did create the universe because I think God was the one who banged. Uh, yeah, because he just, it happened in a split second. That's exactly what Genesis says. In the beginning, God. Well, I won't get into that. But anyway, who created the universe? Guess who created the universe? You created the universe. How did you do that? And why did you create mosquitoes? We created the universe because now we're into the world of the multiverse. I, I, I'm not going to explain that to you right now, but simply the multiverse is that we are on one planet in one dimension, and there is, used to be there were, you know how dimensions there are? Used to be there were five dimensions. This week, the science discovered a way of proving the fifth dimension. That's great. But real science has said, if you can have five, why not why stop there? Because if the universe is infinite, then the potential for infinite universe is there. So in this infinite universe of infinite universes, we are one planet in this dimension. And if we could cross into the fourth dimension, we would find a planet just like us, and we're all on it. Fifth dimension, sixth dimension, seventh dimension, infinity, and we're all there. Some say they're working out things differently. Some say it's just us copying. But this is what kids are believing. And they believe that they just created the universe because they're infinite. And when you die, you just go to another multiverse planet and pick up on a new body. This is what undermines a God. What does God say? Is a point of man wants to be born and wants to die. It's pretty clear, <coughs> just like X and Y is pretty clear. But this is what we're up against. Oddly enough, this is the new battle we face. These guys did not face that battle. They faced a different Satan who had a different plan. Satan's plan was the old rough house. Satan said, well, I got, first I got him to get him to believe that Jesus wasn't who he said he was, that he didn't do what he said he did, and he died and he's buried. And they hid the body. That was the first plan. Uh, it didn't work. Christianity still spread. So then he said, well, if I can't get him from the outside, I'll get him from the inside. And so Satan crept into the church, and in the name of goodness, and that goodness meant we got to get rid of the badness. Satan crept into the church. One good example of this was in the 1700s, early and late. Somebody in the church, probably a Jesuit, decided, let's kill the witches. We have a real problem with witches. Really? I mean, it's like, where are they? Well, we couldn't find those witches, but we began looking for them. You start looking for them, you'll find them. We got an old lady over here, she cooks, and she uses some pretty weird herbs. That's a witch. We got somebody over here that can heal people using moss. Oh, gosh, that's a witch. Well, how do we know? Let's test them. So they came up, and this is a church, by the way. They came up with the idea, we need witch tests. Do y'all know any witch test? Good. The dunking. The dunking test. That's a great one. Bobby, you want to explain it? Yeah. <laughs> There's two forms of the dunking test. They put them in a little chair, they dunk them in the water, and they hold them under. And then if they can't breathe and they drown, 
Well, they're not a witch. They bring up the dead body and say, congratulations, you're not a witch. But if they can hold their breath a long time, they're a witch. So what do they do? They drown them. Or burn them. Or burn them. Uh, the other version of that is they weight them down and throw them into the river, and if they don't float, they're a witch. If they do float, they're not a witch, but they got weights on them. And that, that one actually was, has been reversed in history. Uh, one of my favorites is the witch's spot, where they take a woman and they take a knife and they stab her in places. And if it doesn't bleed, she has the witch's spot. But you got to check all over. So they have to stab her all over her body. By the end of the day, she's bled to death. And they say, congratulations, you're not a witch. But you're dead. All the witches tested ended up in the death of the person. And if they survived, they were burned at the stake. It's a, not a win-win. It's a lose-lose. This happened in the church. You think, that's crazy. Why would they do that? Well, Satan makes people crazy. The Jesuit order was founded to be a legal branch. The Dominican order was the original legal branch, and they set up the laws. And the Dominican teachings were pretty good. And all, suddenly the Jesuit order comes along. It's like, what do we need two legal branches? Well, the Jesuits became the enforcers. The Inquisition in Spain, Jesuits. That's another thing. They brought you in, they questioned you, and then they killed you. They said, well, he was seditious. They didn't believe anything he said. We had that sort of stuff going on. We had the church becoming so corrupt that money was important. I've told you about the Pope who wanted to build a new palace, so he turned the old palace into a brothel to make money to build a new palace. Uh, the Martin Luther situation was they wanted to sell absolution of sin, and they got to where you could buy your sin in advance. You know, it's like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill Bob. How much is that going to cost? But the priest said, that's about nine ninety five. dollars 95 you get a special. And then I would kill Bob, and then they'd say, well, he paid for it. He's absolved from that sin. And the law couldn't do anything because the church held sway over the law. Martin Luther stood up and said, uh, excuse me, it's crazy, isn't it? What did they tell Martin Luther? Pope said, come on down here, let's talk about it. Luther said, no, no I'm not coming down there. Last time I went down there, we never heard from him again. And he went on the run because they were going to kill him, and they stole it the whole war. Protestants killing Catholics, Catholics killing Protestants. And I mean not just killing, I mean brutally slaughtering them. They torched them to death. They burned them. It was horrible. And you're sitting there thinking, this was the church? It's led to Satan's other lie nowadays. So he, and you'll hear this if you talk to people. Every problem, every war that's ever been fought on the face of the earth was because of Christianity. Yeah, okay. What about that Pol Pot thing in Cambodia? That wasn't Christian. Well, it probably was. You can't argue with these people. The persecution is that Christian's bad. Everybody else, though, seems to be okay. Even Islam, which has a whole branch of terrorists. How do I know that? We don't want to hurt their feelings. They can blow us up, and they can blow up our buildings and crash planes into our buildings, but we don't want to hurt their feelings and talk about it. You know, there was all kinds of stuff, and it's still going on. Uh, I saw where a father sued a school district because he was he was in Iraq and he fought in Iraq and he comes home and finds out that they taught his child um, Islamic teaching and taught them to respect and to revere Islam. And he got all bent out of shape because he said, I've just been killing Muslims and they've been killing us. Uh, he sued. He won the lawsuit. But this is the world we live in. Like I said, you take it from sexuality, from homosexual, transgender to... LBG, it's a LG, LG, LBGT plus now, and if you notice that, because there's at least 50 other things in there. Uh, there's a hundred genders, according to people. Uh, this is insanity, but guess what? Satan is insane. He is a psychopath, and he's teaching insanity to our people and to our children. Paul and Silas had to deal with brutality. We have to deal with a mental attack, and the problem is when you deal with a mental attack, say, I can take you guys out right now and beat you with whips. I wouldn't enjoy it much. But you would get better, unless I beat you to death, of course. But you you would get better, you'd heal, and it'd be over. Then I might have to beat you again. But if I put a thought inside your brain that confuses you enough, it will eat away like cancer. It will make you doubt, make you question, make you worry, make you wonder. Then it will sow seeds with your friends. 
because in this room, if Diane believes one thing, Debbie believes something different, and Jean believes something different, they can't have a conversation anymore. It's conversation is gone. Now it's, you've got to believe what I believe, or I'm not going to talk to you. That kills me, because if you know me, I would rather debate than eat a brownie. I love debate. Some people call it the argument, but I try not to argue. I just, I say, let's get the truth, put it on the table, and see how it plays out. No, 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 no. Because we don't want to deal with your truth. I don't have a truth. There is a truth. Every religion, by the way, shares some of the same truths. It's interesting to note that all these religions of the world, we have very much in common with them. Uh, Buddhism, their theology, their basic line of theology is on suffering, which is a large part of our theology. That's why a lot of people say, oh, Christ was a Buddhist. No, he wasn't. I'm sorry. But just because the Buddhists believe that suffering is a way of understanding and knowing, Jesus taught that too. Uh, but that doesn't make Buddhist Christians. You'd be amazed if people think it does. Uh, my point being, in a broader scope, is that we're being attacked on various levels. Some places, it's the brutality. Places where you have, and I, and don't, I don't think I'm mean for saying this, but places where you have a less intellectual citizenry, brutality works. Let's start with the women that are in kindergarten. Yeah, in this society, that's what we're doing. We're starting early, because once you get it in a kid's head, it's hard to get it out. Uh, now, we do this. We've done this, and we proved it wrong. And people have told me, they said, you teach your kid about Santa Claus? Yes, I did. You lied. I said, yes, I did. At some point, though, I told them the truth. Well, that don't make it right. I said, well, it's a little different teaching about Santa Claus than telling Satan it's the good guy. I said, it's a story. It's like a fairy tale. But I had a friend who was in the church I was working in, North Catawba. He lived right down the road from me. And every time I walked church I walked by his house he would come out Christmas time it was a headache he'd say you putting up a tree I said, yeah you know that's a German pagan thing yeah I know you're going to put lights on it yeah. you know that's pagan too yeah, I know you're going to put a yule log up I said probably not I might eat one though because you can get it when you mix it <laughs> that's, a, that's a pagan thing yeah I know it's a pagan thing you're going to get presents yeah it's a pagan but I'm giving them Everything was pagan. Easter. You gonna hunt Easter eggs? Yeah, you know that's a pagan thing. Yeah, I know that's a pagan thing. Believe in a bunny? Well, bunnies are real. Oh, that's a pagan thing. Everything was a pagan thing. And we'd had this conversation every holiday season. Halloween, he lost his brain. I put out a jack-o'-lantern, and he's like coming down the road looking. And next day I walk down the road, he's out of the house. Is that your jack-o'-lantern? I said, yeah, I thought I'd put up a pagan thing. <laughs> it just drove that man crazy. The, the crazy thing was, he had kids, and the kids came home one day, and they had been at school, and they made jack o' lantern. And he goes to school. But you, you know, people like that are Christians, and they're Christians that are crazy Christians because they want to squelch everything. They want you to sit in your house and listen to the radio because TV, by the way, is evil. Um, but it's like, well, can you watch those preaching services? No, can't watch that. But you can listen to them on the radio. Never figured that one out. His wife, she finally confided to me one day. And she said, what do I do about my husband? I think he's going insane. I said, I could have told you that a long time ago. <laughs> but they eventually split up, but that's neither here nor there. But this is the, the battle we wage because we have Christians who take it to an extreme, and we have Christians who take it to the extreme the other way. Then we have satanic people who don't even know they're satanic people they don't believe in demons do you believe in demons anybody not believe in demons yeah. okay you, you don't believe in it yeah, okay <laughs> just make sure. alcohol for demons yes <laughs> it's a tool of the demons but demonic possession is in the bible for people to say because i've had christians say well i don't believe in demons i said well do you, do you believe in the bible well yeah i said it's in the bible was jesus casting out demon or curing gas because now they say, well, he was a great psychologist. Where did he get his degree? When he cast out a demon, they, they come up. And, and I think like the kid who fell into the fire, 
uh, he did show all the signs of epilepsy. Maybe, yeah, he, maybe he was epileptic. They wouldn't know what that was, so it's a demon. Some things they called demons that weren't demons, but some things they called demons were demons. The Genesaret man, he had demons in him, like a hundred of them. And they said, we are legion, or we're many. And the man was trying to kill himself because he couldn't get the demons out. I think that's a pretty good sign of demon possession. The other demon possession that we see today, and we see it if you look, you have to pray for a discerning spirit, is people who are in the influence of demons, not possessed, but influenced by demons, and they will do and believe it. And the sign is they become suddenly anti-Jesus. And that's sort of the key. They begin to say, well, I hate Jesus because it's a lie. How do you know it's a lie? Well, I just do. And they don't realize that how Satan has influenced them because they're taking the popular viewpoint of the day. And it is popular. And that's another little seed that Satan has sown into people's hearts. That you can study the Bible, but you're, it's more important to be popular and to be liked than anything else. And I will do anything to be accepted by the world because I have to live here. Well, I'm old. I could care less if I'm accepted by the world. I'm about the point where I could care less if I live here. I could die here and probably come out a lot better, except I'd miss Debbie a lot. I'll take you with me. Just like notebook, remember? Okay, no. <laughs> but really and truly, I guess that's part of age, but I remember as a young man thinking, I remember what Paul said. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. In other words, I get to see more Christ. You won't hear that today. Today, it's, I want to live forever. I want to succeed. I want this and this. I want, I want, I want. It's all about desires. And where do desires come from? Desires is a weird thing. Because a desire is not necessarily bad. But it's very easily perverted. And that's the problem. Satan is a perverter of truth. I desire a new home. Is that bad? Not necessarily. But if I desire it so much that I will cheat, lie, rob, and steal to get it, it has been perverted. But you know what? Debbie and I have talked about this sometimes. You know, we live in a house. It's a good house. We can live there for the rest of our life. Sure, it'd be nice to have a house in the mountains or at the beach. That's just a desire, but it's not an obsession. You know, we're not going to go out and sell a kidney. Are we? <laughs> so desire is not bad. It's just when it's perverted by Satan. And Satan perverts desires. Uh, now, I did want to get a little bit into this lesson today. Because I wanted to say that because of what Bob said. Because open your eyes and look at what's going on in the world. We live in a cesspool of lies. Most of the stuff coming at us is a lie. And I hate to say it that way because, you think, well, Brooks is really obsessed on lying. But it's hard to believe half of what you hear. Uh, look at the Ukraine war. Everybody's like, oh, we got to stand with Ukraine. Well, and then out comes a couple of people, Tulsi Gabbard, who I do respect. She said, there's another side to that. He was doing some things in this country that weren't good. But I wanted, if I could have talked to her, I said, I agree, Tulsi probably was, but it doesn't justify the invasion, does it? And I think she'd say no, because she's pointing out that there's problems over there that we don't want to talk about. The other problem she pointed out is we got 32 chemical, biological weapons labs in the Ukraine. Boy, that story went away in a hurry. It's like, we're worried about Wuhan, and we have 32 of those places. You know why they're in Ukraine? Because according to the agreements, of part of the Geneva Convention, but also part of the SALT, well not SALT, I forgot the treaty. Anyway, it says, cannot have biological weapons. So we don't have any biological weapon labs in our country. We funded Wuhan. We built 32 in Ukraine, but we kept the promise that we don't have any in our country that we know of. It's a lie. And if you call it a lie, you're so negative. Just go with it. Transgender, homosexuals, just go with it. You're not hurting anybody. Really? Have you seen the figures? Pedophilia. Through the roof. Child sex trafficking, 
through the roof. Disneyland? What happened? Walt Disney, I wish he could come back as, you know, as a giant Mickey Mouse and just stomp on these people. They have turned Disneyland into pervert land. And they're real happy about it because we're so inclusive. I heard the CEO sitting there talking about, we are headed for inclusivity. I said, well, you won't be including me. Uh, anyway. In this, we finished in chapter 15 talking about the letter. And the reason all this fits in, by the way, is this letter. James wrote this letter so that the Gentiles could go without being circumcised, but they added a caveat. And he said, okay, you don't have to be circumcised, but you remember we said this last week, you can't eat things polluted by idols, sexual immorality, uh, anything that's been strangled or from blood or from ancient generations. In other words, they said, you won't have to do that, but here's things you have to do. These are Jewish laws. Now, if Jesus was here, he'd say, why? I know he would. He said, well, if they're free, if we have been set free from the law, because that's what Jesus did. Jesus set us free from the law by fulfilling the law and giving us the object of his grace, death on the cross, resurrection. We have overcome the law. Now, that doesn't take the law away in reality. In other words, we still shouldn't kill people. Thou shalt not murder. But if you have the God's grace and the Holy Spirit, the likelihood of you breaking those laws, it gets less. Now, yeah, there's people who act out of passion, commit murders and stuff like that, but the likelihood becomes less because if you commit a sin, if you break one of the commandments, which we do, by the way, there is a power within us above ourselves. People say, well, that's your conscience. No, it's not. If I did something evil, I could justify it in my conscience and I could live with it. We've proven that over and over. But the Holy Spirit won't let you do that. The Holy Spirit will speak to you. It doesn't hound you, but it will speak to you and say, you know, you have this sin. Confess that sin to God. Set it behind you. Repent. Remember what John the Baptist said? That was his sermon. Repent. Jesus came along. He said, repent and be saved. He added to it. We preach repentance, but we fail to preach salvation through lordship. That's another sermon for you. But they did. They, they compromised here, just like we see today. We compromise all the time. Now, this is not a terrible compromise, but it is a compromise. When you say, okay, you don't have to get circumcised, but you've got to do these things according to Jewish law. You won't be a Jew, but you act like a Jew, and we'll be happy with that. So that's what they did. They sent that all over the churches, and everybody was happy for a while. Uh, in the last part of that, I think we talked about Paul and Barnabas. They got in an argument. Uh, the argument was over Mark, uh, or John Mark, as some say, because he had deserted them, as Paul puts it. Barnabas says he left us. He didn't want to go where they were going. He went home. If this is John Mark, if this is Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark, it's understandable. Because Mark would have still been a young man. Scholars, that when they look at uh, the Passover supper, they believe that was at Mark's house because a young boy followed Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane and watched him in prayer. And that's in the Gospel of Mark. It's in no other writing. So they think, that's Mark. He followed Jesus. That would have put him about 12 to 13 years old. And he followed Jesus, then he became a follower. Now it's several years later, but he's still a young man. And I think he just wanted to go home. And he did. But probably this was served God too because when he went home, he probably sat down with Peter and Peter told him the gospel. See, Mark didn't write the gospel. He, it was dictated to him by Peter. And then Matthew and Luke took Mark and used as a basis of their gospel but they knew some stuff that Mark didn't, that Peter didn't tell Mark, so they added that in theirs. I, we talked about that earlier. But anyway, Paul, who Paul, in, particularly here in his early ministry, shows a little bit of his stubbornness. <coughs> and Paul was a stubborn man. I mean, th think about it. You don't stone somebody to death and he gets up the next day and walks back in town. That's a stubborn guy. I'd be walking the other direction. But he didn't. And he's stubborn here with Barnabas, and so they split. And 
he comes in verse 16, or chapter 16, he comes to Derby, to Lystra, and a disciple there named Timothy, and we talked a little about Timothy. Timothy had a <laughs> Jewish mother and a Greek father. Uh, he begins to follow him. And in verse 6, they were in Phrygia and Galatia, uh, having been forbidden, I'm not, pardon me, they weren't in it, they, were, they went through the region, and having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, and that is in Phrygia and Galatia, and places like that. Uh, they came to Myasia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. This has been a big mystery, and we talked a little bit about it. Why did God not let them go to these places? Anybody want to venture a guess? I think I gave you one last week. Probably so. They were a lot of Romans, a lot of Gauls, a lot of barbarians. So it's like the, the message is moving west. If it had stayed right there in Asia, it might have gone no further. It might have become an Eastern religion and stayed there, just like Eastern Orthodox stayed. But right after this is the Macedonian call. The Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Masia, they went to Troas, which is Troy, and a vision appeared to Paul and night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And Paul saw the vision immediately, sought to go to Macedonia. That takes it... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Is Troy? Is Troy? Yeah. Okay. The city of Troy. And like I said, for a long time, people said Troy didn't exist. It was just a made-up story by uh, Homer. And then they found Troy. And what's odd is it's in the Bible, and it's right where it says it was in the Bible. But they, everybody denied it. Why? Well, because they don't want the Bible to be true, quite frankly. It's, I used to read a magazine called Biblical Archaeological Review, and the interesting thing about that magazine was they were constantly talking about how people were trying to misdirect information about archaeological finds. You know, they found Jericho, First thing was, somebody said, it's not really Jericho. What is it? It's something else. What? I don't know. But it's like anything in the Bible, we cannot admit it's real. Yeah, it's weird because it's like, well, what about <coughs> Jerusalem? Well, that's always been there. It's in the Bible. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. But anything you find, so it's not real. So they and they use things like, remember when they found the ossuary boxes? You all remember that? A box. What they do is you put you put you in a grave. Uh, and then they let your body decompose, and they go in, they gather up all the boxes, and they put it in an ossuary box, and they put it on a shelf, and then they reuse the tomb. Well, they found one, and it had James, the brother of Jesus, scratched on the side. They checked the patina, because they said, maybe this was done later, and they said, oh, no, this is first century. So it's like, that's probably a different James. James, brother of Jesus, there were a lot of Jesuses around those days. So it's like, well, that doesn't mean anything. They said, we're still looking for the body of Jesus. He's resurrected. I don't know about that. The disciples probably hit him. Where'd they get that idea? That was a heresy presented by Gnostics, and yet they jumped at the chance to believe it. We could talk all day about Gnostics and their heresy, but I won't. Anyway, it, it, the Macedonian call is the beginning of the gospel spreading to the Western world. I don't know if you don't think that way, but here's, there's Asia Minor and there's Greece. Right there is the dividing line between the Orient and the Western world. People don't realize that. Uh, Israel is actually an Oriental country. It's not a Western country. They read backwards, just like all Oriental countries. Their language is written in glyphs instead of in words. You go right across the isthmus there, you come into Greece, they read left to right, and their letters are actually sounds and letters, the way we think. Uh, it's, it's really odd that it happened that way. But for some reason, the people in Greece, left to right, people in Turkey, right to left. Pictured words, letters. Go figure. So they go. Uh, your first story is the conversion of Lydia. And the, they... They were going, they went through Samothrace, it says there, then the Neapolis, then the Philippi, uh, which was the leading city of Macedonia. It was a Roman colony. It was not the capital of Macedonia. I think I told you that, and I was wrong. Philippi was named after King Philip, but it's not the capital. It was a Roman colony. Now, in those days, when the Romans mustered out, and I've told you this, but when they, when they mustered out of the army, if they were in the field 
Palestine or Greece, they were given the option, you can go home or we will give you land, lots of land and money. So if you retire, you could go to a place like Philippi where a lot of Roman soldiers have retired. They had really nice homes and money outside of Philippi and it was like a little Roman colony. And that's what Rome wanted. They wanted to spread Romans everywhere. So you'll find the Capolis in uh, outside of Galilee, on the other side of Galilee, the Capolis was 10 Greek cities. So the Greeks are the ones that started doing this first. Just a little Jeopardy information. Uh, they go outside the city to the river for a place to pray. Uh, it's also where they go for the water and stuff. And they met a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira. And she was a seller of purple. Anybody know the significance of that? Purple? What? Royal. Is that what you guess? Yeah. Purple was reserved for nobility. And then, if you weren't a noble, but you could afford it, you could buy some purple cloth. But to buy a purple cloth, uh, I don't know. Remember when minks was a thing? All you girls wanted a mink stole, but you had to be able to afford it. Today, so look, I have this on. What is that? <laughs> I don't know. Is that, I is that chaps? I have no idea. No. I think it's chaps. When I was a kid, we wore the alligator Lacoste. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And my dad said, I'm going to get you an alligator shirt. <laughs> well, pretty soon alligators weren't the thing. Penguins became the thing. You get a penguin shirt. That was like a big deal. My dad was a clothes hound. <laughs> and we were poor, but he wanted us to look rich. Yeah. And so he drove a Lincoln Continental and wore alligators and penguins. When Polo came in, he said, I can't afford that. <laughs> so I was like, you got to wear a polo shirt. And I would hear kids at school saying, he doesn't even have a polo shirt. Yeah. Same way with purple. If you're wearing purple, you're somebody. And they'd kill you for your purple shirt. But, but she made it. So we, we know she's rich. And it says here, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you've judged me, be faithful to the Lord. Come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon him. Now, I'm out of time, but I wanted to add one thing. Because I've been talking about Paul and Silas. Uh, this is more trivia, but it might clear up some confusion. If you read in 1 Corinthians, somewhere in the first chapter, you'll hear about Paul and Silvanus. If you go to 1 and 2 Thessalonians, uh, the first chapter of both those starts with a greeting from Paul, Timothy, and Silvanus. And everybody said, who's Silvanus? Until they realized that these names are different. Silvanus is Silas. It's a Greek name, but if you use it in Koine Greek, it's Silas. Now, what is Koine Greek? Koine Greek is spoken Greek. It's just like, if, we, if I'm preaching, I try to sound like I'm intelligent. But if we're just talking, I sound like I'm a country bump and a hick. Koine Greek is hicked off. Slang, all kinds of stuff. Classical Greek is what Luke used, by the way. He wrote this. But this is written in classical Greek and the, the gospel is written in classical Greek. Mark, Matthew written in Koine Greek. So when you read them in the original languages, it's like reading Jerry Clower as opposed to Jeremiah, David Jeremiah, you know. But a lot of people like Koine because they thought this is how real people talk, and they did. But Silas and Sylvanus, when you see Sylvanus, you're reading someone who's jotting something down in classical. Uh, but here, Luke, for some reason, does the opposite. He talks about Silas. He does use Sylvanus at one point, I think, but most of the time he'll refer to Paul and Silas. So Paul is traveling with Silas, who is Silvanus, who's a Greek, and Timothy now, who is half Greek, half Jew. Uh, I'm going to save this story because it's it's a good one about Paul going to jail. Him and Paul, Paul and Silas are in jail. Remember, oh, what's his name? The singer that I used to sing all his songs. He wrote a song about this. Yeah. 
and then he came, then he, it, it's what everybody's gay and nobody even sings this song. No, uh, it's a uh, Christian singer. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, when he came out and said he was gay, everybody Holmes. called this. No. I still like him. Ray. But Ray Bolts. Ray Bolts. Oh, he just disappeared. Well, I think it's sad because he wrote some good songs. And uh, anyway. But I hope I've offended enough people today. Those online. Who's online? <laughs> I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> nah, I don't mean to offend people, but I do this so easily. It's like a gift I have. Uh, but I, I have this weird thing, and I think you guys too, or you wouldn't listen to me. It's like you want to know the truth, and when you hear the truth, you love the truth. And you don't like people blowing smoke at you. Or as the old saying goes, and I changed it to fit me, I don't want somebody spit in my face and tell me it's raining. There's another way of saying that, but I think that one's better. But we live in a world where people are spitting in our face every day. And what's sad is when Christians start spitting in your face and say, don't tell the truth, that's rude. I just want to spit in their face. But I'm not that kind of guy. Uh, anyway, thank you for listening today. We'll pick this back up next week. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and this opportunity to come together as friends, to read your word, to share your word, to, to look at some of the meaning and some of the things behind the scenes that we don't always dig into, but also to try to pull it forward so that we can understand the first century as it relates to the 21st century. Lord, without sounding so negative all the time, but I think we are in perilous times, uh, and it feels like we're on the verge of something. That something could be tribulation or it could be going home. I don't know which it is, but it just feels like it because there's so much going on in the world today that is trying to dis dispel the truth of God, trying to turn Jesus into a myth. And Lord, give us the strength, the courage, the faith to stand for you in our lives and everything we do and say. Forgive us of our weaknesses when this comes about, Lord, but strengthen us. Now, we've mentioned folks today that have special needs. Uh, health and different things. And Lord, there are a lot of people we did not mention because we figured they don't want us to talk about them in public, but we know people that have real pressing needs that are not only physical, but sometimes mental and emotional needs. And Lord, I pray for them because you know their situation even better than we do. So Lord, please bless them and strengthen them in their time of need and help us to be a minister to them if we can. Again, forgive us, strengthen us, help us be the people that you want us to be. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Did you say no one was Marcia's here today. Marcia. Randy was watching. Who? Randy. But I think he just Well, I can't put him on there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Randy, you don't count anymore. <laughs> but uh, Marcia's here. Marcia, is Keith with you? Can you tell us? <laughs> we'll, we'll count him. Sure. Yeah, we're going to count.